we run a small nonprofit where people can essentially buy a gift basket for people that are in need. Since there are goods exchanged for the money donated, even if it is not to the person who paid for it, is it still a tax deductible donation? Furthermore, does that now make the transaction subject to sales tax or UBTI? So it's still tax deductible. Um, you really only have to worry about the tax deductibility if you, as, as the donor or the sponsor, receive some benefit of material value, right? So if, um, you know, you go to a gala event and you get the fancy dinner and entertainment and free wine or whatever, that's where you always, you know, the donor, because they have the resources and made the donation, but it's not fully tax deductible because not 100% of this is going to the mission. They're getting something in return for that. But in this case, we're talking about the person, you know, is, is per, you know, quote, buying a gift basket for a beneficiary or someone in need. Um, that donor's not getting anything of value, at least I'm assuming based on this, is not getting anything of value. That That item of value is going to the person in need, which is pretty much the way this works. Am I? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the way I read it too. Yeah. Um, and then the UBIT and the sales tax. So not subject to sales tax or tax or UBIT, at least in my, I mean, I think if you were selling the baskets to as a fundraiser to people who were buying them just, Oh, I want to buy this basket from you and I'm not one of your beneficiaries or clients. I mean, then you would be looking at potentially a UBIT unrelated business income tax issue where that really isn't probably in line with your mission. Um, right. So then that would be an issue, but, but I don't think from at least the way this is worded, it doesn't trigger any, any of those, um, those taxes or those, those situations. Right. Yeah. So, so you, Unrelated business income tax, which is UBTI and UBIT, it's unrelated business income. And so what that means is that you're, the thing that you're engaged in is unrelated to your mission in some way. So um, if, and, and, and the, the rules are sort of complicated. So sometimes you think it could be related and it's not related. It's a good thing if you've got an accountant or an auditor involved in your organization to talk to your accountant about because they understand specifically how the rules for unrelated business income work. But, but the general principle is, if it's, if it's your mission. So again, we'll, we'll use our opera company, right? If you're selling tickets to an opera, um, you probably don't need to include sales tax because you're a nonprofit, but again, sales tax is a state by state, um, difference, right? So depending on right. what state you're in Nevada, most likely you don't need to charge sales tax on things. As a matter of fact, if you have a nonprofit that has a gift shop, the gift shop doesn't need to charge sales tax in Nevada, which is crazy because every other state in the country yes. charges sales tax yes. on that. I remember the first time I, engaged, I encountered that and I was like, I need something in writing from yes. you that yeah, says right. that. <laughs> That's, that doesn't sound right. But the um, so so sales tax is a different issue that comes to the state. Unrelated business income is is like how how does it relate to your mission? Yeah. So the opera company, if they start um, selling meals for you know the food that that you're charging like if you want to give them a dinner before the opera like that's the kind of thing that you need to start thinking about is this unrelated business income because it doesn't really have anything to do with opera or performing arts right it's food yeah. so so you need to you need to be careful about those kinds of things but in this case yeah like just exactly what Stacey said if it's if you if the donor is not receiving anything of value in exchange for that transaction like then then you unrelated business income does not come into it um, and it's not, it's, it, sales tax doesn't come into it. And it's totally that, that contribution is still totally tax free to that donor. Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit with your host, Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding. Hey, everybody. Welcome. You've made it to another episode of Nonprofit Everything. Thank you, first, for subscribing or downloading or listening on your phone or in your car or whatever. We appreciate you. Um, we we are always excited when we look at the statistics of how many people are listening to each episode. And sometimes it's a little terrifying, the number of people that this goes out to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but we want to thank you for taking the time to do it. Um, Stacey and I love doing this. We do. Um, and we love getting your questions. So please go ahead and send your questions into us because that's how this works is you send us questions. 
Uh, we look at them, we research them a little bit, and then we answer them. And then every two weeks, we show up just wherever you happen to be. <laughs> it's like having us just come over, which could be bad too. <laughs> but we're presented by the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits. Um, thank you so much for to Anne for um, continuing to support the podcast. Um, if you're not a member of Anne, go check them out. There's a bunch of cool stuff coming up. Um, it's the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits.com. This episode of Nonprofit Everything is sponsored by the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits Job Board, your one-stop shop for the next step in your career. Searching job listings is totally free, and AN members receive a big discount when posting new jobs. There are dozens of nonprofit jobs available right here in Nevada, and there are out-of-state jobs too. Find it by going to the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits webpage and clicking the Job Board button, or access it directly at jobs.alliancefornevadanonprofits.com, or find the link in the Nonprofit Everything show notes. I've heard you bust at least a couple of nonprofit myths on the podcast. For example, nonprofit does not mean no profit. Free stuff is not necessarily the best stuff. What are some of the other myths that nonprofit staffs believe that keep their organizations from fulfilling their missions? Oh, this is a good one, Andy. Another full episode question. <laughs> you are going to have to stop me because I could just talk about okay. this for a full hour. So I want Go. you to interject. Okay. <laughs> well, so... One big one that comes to mind that's a little different than the couple of examples that the, the person asking the question gave was sort of this perpetuating the, the overhead is bad myth internally within nonprofits. So you see it happen all the time. Nonprofits are so busy trying to say they have low overhead to all the funders who don't always understand why overhead is important and critical to running a successful business, but they start to believe it themselves. And so it really worries me because you'll hear like at a board meeting, you know, board and staff members are, are taking pride in, oh, our overhead is only 7%. And they're, they're feeding into that myth and, and getting people programmed to think that, in my opinion. Like, I think that is as serious until we start to talk about a difference saying, yes, that's one that's not the only factor that you measure a nonprofit against. Right. That right. may be one that you look at, but but. We're proud of investing and paying market rates, you know, for our for salaries. We're proud of investing in professional development for our staff and having computers that aren't broken and chairs that people aren't like getting back issues from. Right. So. <laughs> so, I mean, I, it, like we care about we don't want to victimize our own staff and serving clients like we do the clients, like because we're we're caught up in that. So. So I, I think that's a myth that is is really becoming pervasive in in just the way even nonprofits talk about themselves internally, which worries me. So what do you think the solution is? So, I mean, it's it's one of those things The overhead keeps rearing its ugly head for primarily because it's so obvious on the 990. So you do your functional expense statement on the 990 and you break it into program, admin and fundraising. And it's there in black and white and anybody can do the math. So the, the staff is, is always pressured. So, so, you know, when I'm, one of the things that I like to do with nonprofits when I'm working with them on, on finance stuff is help them figure out that there are, you know, when you can actually divide the salaries based on how much of your time is spent on different things. And like you can, if you're working 50% on, on program stuff, that 50% of your salary should be put in program stuff. And let's figure out a way to make it so that your bookkeeper can understand how that works. Right. So yeah. actually get that. This, so there are easy ways to, to change that number without actually changing the way your nonprofit works. Yes. But the, but you're talking about like the next level, which is the board being like, what is this virtue signaling? They're just proud that yes. we've got low overhead. So what can the staff do differently? Because, they, because they're going to be, they're always going to be trying to, I feel like they're always going to be trying to um, minimize the amount of fundraising and admin percentages because it shows up on the 990 and because they know that funders aren't as, as, as into, like, they just don't get it. Like they still get asked the question, like it still shows up on grant applications. It's going to be there. So I feel like ignoring it or like pretending it like, you know, like just taking a stand, like, you know, forget it. Who cares? We're going to do whatever we want. Yeah. Like that just feels like it's a sucker's game. I, so I feel like there's a few specific things I would do if I were in an organization with this, right? One, I would make it a topic because like, let's not just perpetuate it by, by letting people like board members or whomever keep making these statements. Like, 
let's have a discussion. People have heard, you know, the TED Talk, uh, the Dan Pilata TED Talk, which we can put a link in the show notes. But, you know, and, and whether you subscribe or don't to his philosophy, it gets boards thinking. Every board I've ever shown that video is like, wow, that's so true. And it starts to even change their own mindset, hearing from someone outside of, you know, that's it's not self-serving for the executive director to be saying, yeah, we need to spend more money on overhead. Like, it's like, hey, I also think flipping it back to being really practical. Hey, board member, you have a business. So talk to me a little bit, like really bring it back to their world so they understand it. And then I think the other thing is what what I do is what are the metrics? I, it goes down to met, how do we measure success, mm-hmm. right? That's actually probably where it starts. Where, how do we as an organization measure success? And right. okay, so then what do we need to make that success happen? And then you sort of, you make it less about the overhead number and more about success. And then there's a, I think a greater buy-in at that point to, yeah, we're willing to make that investment or we're willing to raise some extra money or whatever, take some out of, you know, our operating reserve to, to fund this sort of capital investment that's going to help propel us forward. Mm-hmm. So, so, for me, I think that's where it starts. Yeah. And I'd, I'd say avoid self-inflicted wounds. Like, I don't know how many times I've been looked at an annual report and there's actually a flipping pie chart. Yes. <laughs> with oh. like admin and fundraising and, and program, like in a big pie chart. And like, just because that's easy to plug into Excel and that just pops right out. Like, you shouldn't do that. No. Like, just to come up with a different pie chart to put in there. I right? agree. <laughs> right. That's just feeding the cycle. <laughs> I right? specifically told people to take that out. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> It's true. Um, You know, the other thing I was thinking about, and I would, I can't wait because you and I disagree at times. um, I think there is this myth that nonprofits say competition doesn't exist. We don't have competition in the nonprofit sector. Everyone is a potential partner. (laughs) Everyone is a potential collaborator. And I say, BS. And I know there's people listening to this that are probably going to push back immensely because you can look at things as, oh, do we want a potential partnership or a competitor? But I go at the end of the day, people have limited time, limited resources, and where are they going to put them? And so to me, I don't think competition is a bad thing. I think it's a super healthy thing. And I think it's healthy in the nonprofit sector, just as it is in the for-profit sector. But I think... I've done too many, you know, strategic planning retreats where I say, <laughs> I say, so let's talk about your competitive Just advantages, SWOT analysis. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like competitive advantages and who are your competitors? Oh, competitors. We don't use that word. We don't have that. Well, let's be real here. Like you need to be looking at, it doesn't mean other nonprofits per se. It could be for profits. It could be anybody like, guess what? You have competitors with, you know, at least in Las Vegas, the all the shows on the strip uh, that are competing for for your donors' time instead of going to your gala. So, like, <laughs> let's just talk about some of that, right? Yeah. So, so I don't know. I think that's a myth. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think mean, that's that's. I don't know if that's. I wouldn't necessarily call that a myth. I think just to talk to that specifically, that the supply and de- the typical supply and demand problem for a business, right, is that that there's People want some stuff, right? This is or like your first economics class, right? People yeah. want some stuff and you have it so you can sell it to them. But they're, and then you set price based on like how badly they want it and how scarce it is, right? So you've got yeah. a, a balance between supply and demand. For nonprofits, that equation is completely broken. It just doesn't, straight up doesn't apply mm-hmm. because what you're selling right, is the feeling of, you're selling donors the feeling of having done something good and the knowledge that there's been an impact made based on their investment, Mm -hmm. right? That's what you're selling them. And there's not a limited supply of that. Like there's, there's, there's a limited amount of demand for that, as we know. And that's what I think that's what you're talking about in terms of competition, which is like, there are only so many donors, there are only so many funders, there's only so many hours in the day to go to terrible galas, like (laughs) that, that's a limited resource. And that tends to be spread out very thinly over a very large number of people who are trying to do good things. Yes. And so, so I, I mean, think I think in terms of competition for that limited resource, yeah, I do think there's an awful lot of that competition um, based on that time. Absolutely. It does is that bad? I don't think that's no, and I think that's not bad. No. I think that's actually really, really good. But I, don't, you know, having I, I don't maybe maybe boards are different from like development staff because development staff will tell you straight up like this. 
<laughs> like this direct mail piece has to hit on this date because it can't hit on this date because this is what's happening in this date. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they, because they, and that's, I mean, it's just a function of competition. They know that that piece needs to hit the mailbox on that day Absolutely. because of all of the other things that are happening that will prevent, like, like uh, political season is the worst for direct mail, right? Because all of a sudden everybody's mailboxes start filling up with those awful mailers from, from everybody, uh, yes. you know, <laughs> the hilarious yeah. things that you get in your mailbox, right? Uh, yes. So, you know, like, it's just going to be hard to break through the noise or maybe it's not. We should ask a donor. We should ask a, a, a development person, like, like, are people happy saying like, oh, thank goodness. It's a request for money <laughs> right. and not someone <laughs> shouting at me about something. <laughs> I think people are just fed up in general with <laughs> any, any more information. Interesting. Right? We should test that. We <laughs> should test it. And you know what? I think you make a good point, though. I think it really depends on where the person's sitting in an organization. I think that sometimes you have boards who can be idealistic about, oh, competition doesn't exist. You also, I think if you talk to development people versus program people within an organization, I think you get a different answer. Yeah. Right. So, so, so it probably really depends. Yeah. Um, and back to, I don't know, is it a myth or not? I guess I myth is probably not the right word, but just kind of a misconception, right? Like it's a misconception. So back to myth, <laughs> back to myth, myth, a myth. Um, um, what do you think? Like, is there more like, yeah, there's a million, there's more a million more. lobbying. Oh, Okay, so here's one. Here's definitely a hundred percent myth, especially sort of on the smaller end of the nonprofit scale. Like the big nonprofits already know that. Actually, some of them don't, but a lot of the big big nonprofits already know this. Um, that some people think that you cannot spend any money lobbying. Like that if there's an issue that's important to your nonprofit, you have to keep your mouth shut. And that is a hundred percent not the case. So there's some some very specific resources. I would absolutely point people to the National Council of Nonprofits. They've got a huge section. Um, and Anne is the your local affiliate of the National Council of Nonprofits, so you can reach out to Anne or you can reach out to the National Council of Nonprofits, so they can tell you about what is re required and what is not required of you as a nonprofit when you're talking about lobbying. So the thing that is prohibited is that you cannot um, endorse necessarily, or no, you can't give money to a political campaign. So you can't give a candidate money. And generally, you shouldn't endorse a particular political candidate. Like there's very specific rules about what you can and can't say when it comes to campaigns. But in terms of educating, right. there's a ton of resources you can do to educating, which isn't lobbying. No. And lobbying is specifically saying like, by the way, the way you're designing this law is really stupid and this is why. And nonprofits can totally do that. Yeah. And, you know, you, you see some of the, the larger nonprofits, that's a huge part of their it, you know, of their strategy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Educating and getting out there and trying to inform legislation because it impacts the end user. Right. And there's definitely, there's a limit on the amount of money that you can spend on lobbying. I mean, it's, it's vague. And there's a form that you can actually fill out with to, to send to the IRS to let them know that, hey, by the way, we are going to be doing lobbying and this is how we're tracking it. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of keeps mm -hmm. you on the safe side of getting in trouble from the IRS from spending too much money on lobbying. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that you're interested in, definitely check out the National Council of Nonprofits because they got tons of good resources on that. I think another myth that that doesn't happen everywhere, but I've heard nonprofits have this sort of, especially those involved in hiring staff. Oh, it's okay that we're not going to pay much because they're in it for the mission, right? It's all about the mission. And I really worry about that because it absolutely does make a difference. And I think more and more we're hearing that. I mean, the sector is having a hard time attracting talent. The se those in the sector who aren't paying fair market wages. Mm -hmm. And so that, that is a myth that, that let's get that out of our head. Yes. Someone wants to work for a good organization or a greater cause and they want to get paid fairly. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not a, you get to trade out one for the other. Yeah. I've actually, I had a, I've probably told this story before. I actually had a board member tell me that, Ugh. um, that said directly to me, like that we can't pay that person. No, I know that's the fair wage. I know that's what you could get for that position in a for-profit, but you know, they they decided to come work for a nonprofit, so they deserve to they deserve to be paid less. No. So you know, makes I, my stomach I did not punch them, which was oh. my immediate reaction because that would have probably not helped my um, <laughs> argument. But I think it's really that one's related to the overhead myth. It is right? is that we need. I mean, and part of it is that sort of scarcity scarcity mindset that there's just not enough money to go around, and and 
that's okay, but you need to think about your, your nonprofit as a business too. You need to raise money to, you need to have money in order to do your stuff you need to do. And in order to get money, you need money. And in order to yeah. get money, you need to have people that are going to get the money for you. And in order to do that, well, just like with your regular business, you need to pay them what they're worth. Absolutely. Um, I, I've, I've had, you know, the opposite conversation with, with board members in larger nonprofits too, that totally understand that, that are willing to defend the, what they're paying their, ex, their nonprofit executives to the death, yes. maybe not death, but close, right? <laughs> yeah. That, you know, that this is what we need this person. This person has this experience and we're going to hire that person. We're going to pay them what they're worth. And, you know, there's, there's a newspaper in town that always, every once in a while, will part, you know, will take everybody's executive director salaries and publish the salaries in the newspaper with like a wagging finger emoji, yes. right? So, oh. yeah. And so, and, and, and that has an effect on donors. Oh, you does. see, you see. And you hear people talk about it and just people on the street. We've gotten letters. Yes. I've gotten, when I was working at Three Square, we got actually, someone sent us a letter. Um, with, you know, we sent them a direct mail pace. They sent us back a letter and said, I will not be supporting your nonprofit because you pay your executive director too much. <sighs> and, and you know, it, it hurts. But at the end of the day, eh, they probably weren't going to give us that much anyway, right? Yeah, like you just yeah. lost 10 bucks. And let's let's have conversations with people who understand the value of it, right? And not not just like respond and react to the worst, you know, the, the worst instincts of people who just don't get it. Absolutely. Like you can't, that you'll kill yourself worrying about that all the time. So I think one one more myth that I've, I've heard again, probably mostly from smaller nonprofits that haven't quite figured it out yet, is is that most of the money in a nonprofit needs to come from donations. Mm. That that donations are the primary source of revenue for a nonprofit, and that you or can't grants or grants, yeah, foundations. Like yes. you get most of your money from foundations, and when you look at so if you scan the like the wider like if you look at all of the nonprofits in the U.S. and and granted, that includes some hospitals and universities and things like that, which skew it crazily. But um, the majority of the money actually comes from earned revenue, yeah. from like actual some sort of service that you're getting a fee from. And, the you know, and you think about like, for example, a, an opera company, right? Operas are expensive to put on. Like if it were possible for them to charge enough money for the opera, like if they were charging the amount of money for the opera that it would cost to put the opera on, the tickets would be like, $1,500 a piece, like maybe more. And so they need assistance from the community to be able to create that art, right? But at the same time, it doesn't make it free. It's not yeah. 100% fundraising. It's a mixture of fee-for-service plus fundraising or yes. or doing a government program where you're where you're trying to get money, but you actually have to do a service and you're getting a fee-for-service back from the government. So um, for, for small nonprofits, I think the myth is like fundraising is the way you get your money, but in reality, it's it's got to generally at least 50 percent or more needs to be. It does. Service. And you look at the trends nationally and that's where it's going. I mean, I I'm I sit there and talk to organizations all the time and say, listen, if you don't have that earned revenue stream, you probably aren't going to sustain yourself, especially given some of the, ta you know, the Tax Reform Act and the fact that there's also donors who um, donor fatigue donor retention is at an all time low. So I don't think relying just on that donation end is getting people where they need to go. And I think we're seeing the national trends with it. Yeah. So. And it's, it's dangerous too. I mean, this is, this is one of the reason, one of the reasons that organizations burn through development people so quickly yes. is that like, it just gets exhausting to have to be the one person who's responsible for everything, yeah. you know? And like, can you please do some work too? Cause I'm doing a lot of work trying mm -hmm. to get enough money to make this organization continue to work. We need to come up with something that's a little more steady state. Andy, here's a doozy. Our organization has been through a lot of leadership change in the last year. The executive director and senior finance and operations people all left. And now it seems like we can't get anything done. It's like a combination of people protecting their territory and at the same time trying to jettison responsibilities that they used to have but no longer want. I'm just a regular employee, so I don't feel like I have much authority to change it. But it's also like watching a slow motion car crash. Should I go to the board? Help. Mm, I feel your pain. This It's a crap situation, isn't ooh, it? Man, oh, man. Yeah. But here's the thing. So... Like, I don't know. We're like Stacy and I are switching places today. Like I'm like, this is great. And Stacey's like, this is terrible. So so here here's first of all, it sounds like you're in a big organization. So if there's there's enough enough people like leadership that's left and then there's a board and you're you know, there's enough people that are trying to jettison responsibilities, it feels to me like it's it's a larger organization and not yes. a smaller one, which means 
there is some, there's some leftover inertia. Like you're not going to crash and burn. You're not going to get to the point in the next two weeks where you have to go, Oh my God, go cash your paycheck right now. We're dying. Right. Right. So, so there is some runway. It doesn't sound like everything is on fire. Uh, So, so this is a good opportunity and, and it's a terrible analogy and I hate using it, but I've never come up with a better one. But like sometimes nonprofits are a little bit like Vietnam where you walked in as a private and you walked out as a sergeant Mm. because it's just carnage. Like it is like there, all things are going wrong all the time. And is this is the opportunity to, if you're looking for a leadership position and you want to grow in your role, this is the perfect environment to show that you're a grown up and that you can manage it and you can take on more responsibility because, um, to, you know, the question, should I go to the board? Probably not unless you're in going to do some whistleblower stuff, unless there's like, like people are literally right, stealing. Egregious. Yeah, yeah. There's something nasty going on and you need to make sure that the board is aware of it because you know, that just, it's, there's an ethical reason you need to do that. If things are just, if things are just gnarly, I mean, if, if all of the senior leadership has left, um, the board knows right. <laughs> most likely they're either they're oblivious. I, I certainly hope so. Yeah, they're either completely oblivious or they're aware that something bad is going on. But this is your opportunity to sort of sort of carve out a a position of being, the fact that you wrote us and asked us this question tells me that that you care about the organization. Like because your first instinct is like, ah, oh, get out, quit. Exactly. Like, right. Run, for, run the for the hills. Yeah. <laughs> it's our usual response, right? Yes. Run for the hills. Um, but but since you wrote us, it sounds like you, you care about the organization. You think the mission is important and you want it to continue. And you're disappointed in the behavior of your fellow staff members. So. I mean, for me, one of the things I wanted to want to know is what what exactly is happening right now with the situation? So is the board involved? I don't know if the positions that have been, you know, people have left have been re, like filled again or replaced. I'm mm-hmm. sensing not, but that's not really clear. And has the board stepped in sometimes in these transition periods, right? A board will step in or one board member will step in as more of a, like a contact for staff if there's concerns or things. So in that case, I think it would be appropriate depending on what the board is doing in this situation. Now it probably is a larger organization. So I don't think unless it's whistleblower, you should be going to the board, but let's say you have a board designee that it's been communicated to staff that during this time of transition, if a board member then I think you absolutely have the right to go and talk to them. I also, the, the person who wrote this said they're just a regular employee. I also wonder, do they have any, is there anyone supervising them left that they could even go? And, you know, I don't know if they have a manager or, a, you know, their boss that they could go to and just share their concerns and, and ask if something, you know, what, what is being done. It feels like a big lack of communication that's going on in the organization because um, I, I get the sense this person, you know, who wrote in is just feeling like they're in this limbo, like everyone's, right, going insular and protecting what they've got, which is normal, right? When you're, when you're fearful and when change is happening, I mean, it's just a normal human response. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I would also say to the person writing this, this will not last forever. So if you are committed, and it sounds like you are, I think being able to voice your concern, whether it's your to your boss or if the board has given permission for to, to go to them, to the board, along with maybe some, I don't know, suggestions about what you think, or and the suggestion could be as simple as, we just as staff all feel like really uncertain about the future. Can you keep us apprised board of what's going on Mm -hmm. to fill these positions? Right. We just need to be communicated with and know this isn't a forever thing because a lot of us are ready to, you know, run for the Hills. So, so I, I feel like there's some, there is some opportunity for this person, but I also think you have to, if I were the person in this, in, in, you know, this position, I would look at setting a deadline and say, okay, Like, do I give this six months? This isn't going to get cleaned up overnight, but do I give this six months? Do I sort of check in with myself at a certain point and see, and if we're in the same spot and it's just unhealthy and toxic for me mentally or whatever, it's time to move on because there's at some point only so much you can do. Yeah. So one of the things I'm wondering about this question too is in, you know, my, my answer was sort of like, yeah, it's an opportunity to sort of jump in and get more work done. But, but if it really is toxic, like you're saying, um, other than, other than giving yourself a deadline of six months, if it doesn't get better, I'm getting out of here. Do you think there's anything that, that the, the employee can do to sort of 
insulate themselves from other employees that are not acting in the organization's best interest? Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways it's sort of like put your, like try to avoid the, the drama and sort of work, put, you know, be the example maybe of, of someone who's still committed and working hard. And I know that's difficult. And, and I also think there's a lot of stuff outside of the workplace that needs to happen when this is going on. Right. So this gets into sort of some self care and some affirmations and some things that I think can help, you get in the right mindset when you're in that kind of situation. And if you do want to stick it out, that you're doing some of that to kind of just release the tension of it, you know, go work out or whatever, go take a walk in the middle of the day. I think trying to avoid being coming a part of that internal um, toxicity and drama is, is probably the most important thing. So if that means just sort of holding up and just doing your job um, and continuing to produce, maybe that's, that's the best way to do this. Yeah, I've always found it sort of cathartic in situations like that to to find a group of people that are not in that situation and go hang out and complain to them. Because then <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, for me, I'll just go sit in a bar with people and we'll just complain and we can complain about our jobs all totally. day. But there's no, you know, there, I'm not complaining to another employee. I'm just yes. complaining to somebody that's sort of a disinterested third party who's willing to go, oh, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that sounds and that's terrible. That's good. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you can kind of get it off your chest and like feel like, you know, it's not that bad. And at least I complained about it, but I'm not making it worse. And drinking helps too. <laughs> for us, it does. <laughs> You crossed the finish line of another episode of Nonprofit Everything, and we so appreciate you listening, and uh, hopefully this is a value to you, and what makes it a value are your questions. So here's here's our challenge to you is submit a question, any question, anytime it comes up, and here's the deal. You can email us. You can send it through our Facebook private page, non- or you know the public page on Facebook, Nonprofit Everything. You can go to nonprofiteverything.com and fill it out on the Q&A, or you can just say, hey, Andy, hey, Stacy, I got this question. Will you make sure to cover it? And we take all forms because we want to be here for you and a resource. So, And also, if you are an expert in a topic, we would love uh, to share your expertise because let's be honest here, we no one needs to listen to us all the time, do they, Andy? No, especially when we get things wrong. <laughs> yeah, we, and we do sometimes, and, and you correct us, so thank you. That means you're <laughs> listening. But yeah, if you want to be an expert, we'll make sure that uh, you can fill out the little, uh, the little form to let us know what your expertise is, and, and we'll call on you in the future when there's a question that relates. Mm-hmm.